Okay, I'm going to record now. So, all right, thank you everyone for joining us this afternoon for our January open office hours. Uh, Barb Wainwright and Corey Lovren are going to be speaking to us today regarding monitoring clinical contracted services um, through quality. Um, and so we're going to start out with Barb this morning and then um, Corey will go ahead and present and then we'll take some questions soon after. So let me share my screen. Green. All right, Barb, can you see? I can see. Perfect. So I'll go ahead and get started. Um, and just to let you know, if you don't know, Gerber um, is a critical access hospital as part of a system. So there's, um, you know, seven of the hospitals, well, there's 13 hospitals altogether. But we followed the same process throughout the entire Corwell Health West. Um, so I'll just articulate kind of what, how our process works with contract metrics and um, how I have been involved with prepping um, each location to speak to the Joint Commission Surveyor to get us through um, accreditation. So we'll go to the next slide. Um, just to give you some background, um, there is a Joint Commission standard and leadership standards that we need to closely um, monitor all clinical services provided to the hospital. And in um, 2018, Corwell Health had a citation that they couldn't um, demonstrate effectively that clinical monitoring. And then there was another citation in 21 that they could not show that there had been communication between the two parties, the contracted service and the hospital talking about quality performance. So um, with that, go to the next slide. All right, so from there, um, Corwell Health designed a new um, policy and a new structure to address um, contract metrics, and so that it would meet the Joint Commission and the CMS requirements. And we wanted to ensure that we um, gave good care, treatment, services, and through the um, contractual agreement, and it was safe and effective. And so I'm just going to go through in the next slide, share you the basic structure that we have. It's pretty simple and straightforward. So in our policy to determine which contracts, can you hear me? I'm echoing. Am I okay? You're a little echoey, but you're okay. We can still hear you. Okay, I don't know why I'm echoing. Um, so in our policy, we divide it into two tiers. Tier one was a direct patient care provider. So that was anyone who provided direct care to the patient. Um, that would include um, like anesthesia, emergency, radiology physicians, pathology, hospitalists. It could be um, contracted nurses. So it's really those persons that give that um, direct care. Then in tier two, I'm just going to move over you to my other screen. Oh, I lost you. Um, in tier two, then um, it was for the indirect care providing that provided to the patient. So um, it does not include clinical services directly to patients, but provides ancillary services that support clinical services provided directly to the patient. So that would be like um, calibration equipment, um, sterilization equipment, um, maybe supplies coming into the hospital. So they impact the patient, but they're not like the direct caregivers of the patient. So we have tier one and tier two um, along the way. Does that make sense so far? Mm -hmm. Okay. All right, then go to the next slide. So legal went through and just kind of sorted out who belonged in tier one and two tier two through all of our contracts. So we knew who that it was. And then um, at that point, they had defined in this policy that the contract owners, they assign people in the organization. So if I'm radiology, there is a person, um, a VP of radiology, someone that would um, be the owner of that contract. And they would collaborate with the vendor to determine written expectations of what they would be monitoring for quality. And that expectations would be outlined in their contract. Then those contract owners and um, the vendor meet on a cadence 
to review those quality metrics. And I'm telling you, every hospital has a little different gig on how they do it. Some um, meet with the executive team on a quarterly basis and give a quick snapshot um, of what's going on in case there's any um, problems. Um, other vendors um, come to like our surgery anesthesia contract metrics come to our OR committees across the system. And that's where those metrics are reported in. So it is a little bit different um, depending on that contract where the information is shared. But what is shared for sure is the executive team, the COO, the CNO, um, they have eyes on these um, tier one and tier two metric outcomes. Then from there, there is, a, um, according to the policy, then for quality, we do an annual report to our quality board on general outcomes. So like overall, um, people are in good standing. There's not any significant barriers. Reporting out is occurring. And um, that usually goes like in July and that covers our entire system because most of our um, vendors like anesthesia, radiology, lab, and um, emergency care services are in all of our hospitals, right? So the metrics are kind of uniform across the system. Um, so we bring that to the annual board. Um, when we started this project, we did break it out in phases because you can't start everything at once. So they put tier one as priority to get organized first. And then they um, tiered out down to the tier twos, who comes first, second, third. And it took us probably a couple of years to pull it all together. And so, um, so, so back to where I'm at. So then we do this annual review. It goes to our um, quality board and it goes then for consent agenda up to the Corwell Health um, Safety Board um, that is above that. All right, and we'll go to the next one, next slide. So my experience with Joint Commission has been really simple and straightforward. And um, they, we have a system um, surveyor that goes to all of our sites, and maybe this is why. Um, she understands the structure of how we operate. And she has gone from site to site, because we've had seven surveys in the last year, all out in the community hospitals and the critical access hospitals. And she will ask us to choose what we call one of our big four. Is it um, radiology, pathology, anesthesia or emergency, she'll say to the CEO, I would like to see two of these. Either she'll tell us or she'll say, choose them. And then um, the surveyor meets with the CNO or COO, whoever has the accountability for the overall contracts um, at that entity. And they just have a very short five, 10 minute conversation and the um, entity shares how they monitor, what conversations, are they having any concerns? Um, do they have any barriers? Um, so that goes very quickly. And the thing that the surveyor has asked the most is literally, she'll they'll say, show me in the contract where you have these metrics. And it could be an addendum if it's not written in the general contract. Show me where you have these contracts outlined that are written that you're going to measure. Now show me where the data is. And usually we have dashboards that match and they look at the dashboard. And then they ask, how do you communicate back and forth, ensure quality of care? And that's about the end of the discussion. They really don't get into if it's all red or you're not doing well. Um, it usually runs really quick and um, very um, smoothly along the way. And so where I've been helpful in our system, um, it is it, we had first been, that's how in 2021, I had used that process with the surveyors, and then we just used that same process I would get with the COO, CNO before survey, tell them exactly what I just told you, um, made sure they had their contracts, they were ready, and they were prepared. I would give them a copy of um, when it went to our quality board in case it was asked, because they wouldn't have that at their fingertips. Um, and then I, they invite me to the meeting at the survey, which is very lovely, but I sit there very quietly and support and just listen to the conversation. And we have not had any citations throughout um, since 2021. So it has, this process has worked um, really quite, quite well. So if you can go to the next slide, I can give you an example of kind of what they show. So um, there's a lot of, way you, a lot of ways you can have metrics. 
Um, so for Gerber, for anesthesia, um, they have these kind of, anesthesia tends to have like adverse event metrics. They're kind of national metrics, like, you know, if a dental injury or post-respiratory had to be re-intubated. So this is data that they trend for us. And they also look at LTR and um, anesthesia as part of their metrics. And these are the metrics, like we would say, oh, these are metrics and here's our data, right? And then we would kind of move on. So, and, and data could be whatever your organization determines is appropriate for that particular service and how you pull it. We try to pull everything electronically as we can. But that overall, if you want to, I don't think there's another slide. I think that's the end. That's the end. So um, that is just basically how we do the process. Um, we are exploring, though. Um, I have lost you somewhere. We are exploring, like we've done fairly well at Tier 1, and now we're moving into Tier 2. And with Tier 2, what's kind of interesting is that what I hadn't really thought about is, um, oh, here you guys are, so I can look at your face. Um, I was thinking tier two, like supply chain or something like that. I went to our accreditation team and I said, hey, we got tier one pretty down pat. You know, they might randomly ask for a tier two. Can we be ready to put forward a high volume tier two contract that we know that we're comfortable we have metrics? And that really um, would be around like high risk equipment do we have those quality metrics that are there? So we're kind of exploring and validating that those are in place so that um, Grand Rapids, our large, um, has three hospitals in Grand Rapids with Corwell and Health West. And we have survey uh, March or April. And so we're pretty confident in tier one. And so I'm trying to look right now for like a tier two high risk equipment. So if they say, hey, can you show me one of these? and I have a choice to move it forward, I can move forward a process that's working pretty slick so they can see the intent of, of, of what we're doing. So that overall is our process. Any questions that you have? There was one in the comments. Um, John Anderson wanted to know, do you have system contracts that cover all entities? And if so, do you manage the quality metrics? So I don't manage any equipment. Yes, we have system contracts um, like emergency care system, radiology, and pathology. Anesthesia is a little more broken up, and some community hospitals have like a separate hospitalist um, contract where three quarter of us are a part of the system. So the system contracts are easier because the metrics are defined, and it's for the whole system, right? Um, the Entity specific contracts are a little more trickier because um, they're probably not as polished and as well developed as the quality metrics, but I don't develop those metrics. Quality consults and gives advice and influences, but it's really between the contract owner, whoever's determined by the system, works with the vendor to create the metrics. Now, does that help? Jen? Yes. And then the thing where we're trying to go to in quality, though, is like a playbook. So we have strategic metrics across Corwell Health. And um, we so like, let's say it's patient experience and LTR. We would like that to be in the like anesthesia metric so we can get leverage, right, if it's not there. So now that we've kind of make sure the system is up and running, our next goal is to work with those owners to say, if I was anesthesia, these would be great metrics to suggest and maybe um, have them follow or change. If it's time to change, change to this next step. And so we're in developing this playbook. And then as we um, move across our system to the east and the south, then as they have new contracts come on, we'd have this playbook and then hopefully we can unify across the system, the same metrics for anesthesia, radiology, emergency service. That's the dream. We're not there yet, but that's what we're hoping to move to next. Okay. Um, Jen Monzo wanted to know if you could share an example of contracted equipment metrics. Okay, so supply chain ones that I've been working with Matt is pretty straightforward with what you would think. So it's like, if it supplies uh, like delivery time, um, if they had, um, they track delivery that they get it on time, they can, um, 
it's more like process or like, you know, recalls are taken care of appropriately. You know, they know that that whole process and structure is moving along the way and that they have available supplies all the time. When we need them, we have them, we're stocked correctly. So it's really kind of literally about the process, right, is what I'm finding. Um, and that is just um, developed, it just be, well, it's been developed over the last year. Um, kind of that question, they have a questionnaire to make sure they check all this stuff off to make sure that it's um, in, in place. So. All right, so let me get the chat. Any other questions about that? Was that helpful? Okay. Yes. And then, um, yeah, and then the contract metrics too. So if you really read the contracts themselves, a lot of the stuff is in the contracts underneath um, tier two. You'll see that um, you can easily pull metrics out if they're not already defined and something they're already doing, like for recalls or supply and the timeliness or, you know, return if you haven't got it developed along the way. So quality is kind of there to influence and to, that's why we are to influence the design of the metrics and to make sure that we don't make sure that we ensure that um, there's a um, discussion about them and we have good quality of care and that that information gets reported up to our board. We do have a contract metric um, kind of um, committee, um, steering committee that keeps an eye on this process. And I'm part of that work group that's kind of doing this um, underneath work of making sure the structure is all in place and where we're moving with the playbook. And then we report up to this um, steering committee that's keeping a bigger eye. And the bigger eye, the steering committee has risk on it and compliance on it and qualities on it, accreditations on it. So they can keep that big picture that we're um, in line with what we have to do with regulations. Okay. How did you show the contract service are inclusive in it of the QAPI? QAPI. So, um, our QAPI plan does not outline the contract service metrics. Now, some of the metrics could be in our QAPI plan, like experience along the way. Um, so I don't know if that helps you or not. Um, most contracts say you have to have um, quality, you're maintaining quality. And so it's within the contracts is where you see this um, outlining specific metrics. Um, department dashboards. I, I think you can use any kind of data you want. Hopefully you can get it electronically. So it, it depends on your organization, how you collect the information, like some independent contractors, like where one entity has anesthesiology and it's a smaller um, and it, um, vendor, then they may supply data to the hospital and that's where they get the data to show that they're in compliance and they would have to use that data when joint commission comes. Whereas these larger system ones that we have that go across all entities, we have system dashboards um, that shows the contract metrics. And matter of fact, our radiology department is really slick. Um, they have a dashboard and multiple things like costs, turnaround times, critical test turnaround times being um, timely. And then they have a section on this dashboard about contract metrics. So when they take their executive dashboard to um, the executive team at all the hospitals and across the system, all these metrics are lined up in one spot. They've done a great job organizing it um, along the way. But that's not true of every uh, vendor, every department that we have. So I think wherever you get data is where you have it and you just to be able to show that you have it. So electronic is the best, right? Did I answer that question, Jen? A little bit. And then what contract system do you use? Um, we store our contracts in SMART. The process we use is developed by the policy that we have um, along the way. And we found it, we were just trying to put all of our information, like the contract, the dashboard, the minutes everybody's talking into SMART, but that system isn't allowing us to do that with a lot of headaches. It's being pretty complicated. So um, to make our survey process simpler, instead of trying to gather it from five different areas or six, um, we have a Teams, Microsoft Teams, and we have a SharePoint for accreditation. And so on that SharePoint, um, they're gonna have 
channels where this information is going to get centrally located and then access to limited number of people. And um, that's what we'll use then when we're getting ready for surveys so that we'll have these all these owners bring the information to a central location. And that'll make it a lot easier in the way we're chasing it right now from person to person. Uh, what else do we have, Deb? Is SMART a homegrown model or it's a purchased product? And that's where they store all of our contracts. And that's what it's called, S-M-A-R-T, just like you have it. Uh, but like I said, our legal team defined which contracts were tier one and tier two. So that would, would have to help guide us because not maybe all contracts fit underneath these definitions, right? Because you could have like a million. Uh, you use NTRAX. Yep, that was another tool we used to use in the past. So, yeah. So the important part is, is like you have a process, right? Just simply you have contracts that you're contracting out. They need quality metrics. And whatever you decide, they need to monitor it, communicate it to your leadership to ensure that they're in good standings. And you have to be able to show that when a regulatory winner surveyor comes. And how you do that depends on what resources you have at your entity. But it's pretty straightforward. Any other questions that I'm missing? Oh, okay. Eye contacts. Yeah. And actually, right now, we're looking for a different system, too. I don't know if we're going to stay with SMART or they're going to move to something else now that we're, um, we've are we um, added on other hospitals um, to the south of us, too. So it depends on whatever program you have along the way. And honestly, how I got caught into this is just because I did really well at Gerber and Survey, and then I just happened to get connected to this process from hospital to hospital to hospital, and um, it's worked. So I kind of got thrown into this kind of by osmosis, right? and experience um, along the way, but at least we're moving in the right direction. Uh, what about linen services and interpreter services? Interpreter services, I, they haven't asked for those lower. Interpreter services, I would think, would be like tier one, would be a good example for us. Um, they could ask for that. Linen services, it's possible. That'd be like a tier two, right? Um, Usually what I've seen is them ask for contracts that affect a massive amount of people, like it would have the most impact and the higher risk. So um, that's what we've been putting forward um, in the last year. And I'm waiting for our system surveyors to say, well, I've seen that you guys all do really well in your high risk contracts, but what about X and Y? Because you know from years ago, um, in the regulatory world, they would just say, hey, show me a list of your contracts, and they pick one, two, three, and you just have to show it, right? So there's a lot more contracts that we have that could be a little more shaky than the ones that we've got with the highest risk, but we started out with the highest risk contracts. You guys got really good questions. Hmm. What else can I help with? We'll just give another couple more minutes um, if you have any other questions for Barb, and then we'll transition to Corey, because Corey also is going to talk about working quality improvement into their contracts. Yeah, it's a process, you know, to get everybody on board and have it done and know where all the information's at, like when it comes, you know, where's it all, where's it all lie, you know, because everybody puts it in different locations and is it being done and Everybody does it a little, each entity has done it a little bit differently. And that type of John, John Anderson wanted to know about whether or not you had a contract evaluation checklist. Is that your annual, is that your annual review? Um, they have a report. There's not really a checklist. Um, it based off the contract steering committees review, they kind of give a high level of the um, tier one and tier two high risk contracts that they're like in compliance. And then they look for any kind of barriers um, that are there if we need to improve the program. And so we do list out those higher risk contracts kind of literally like, yes, they're in good standing. Yes, you know, we have quality metrics. Yes, we review them um, along the way, but it's more like of a report that I have seen um, given the last um, three years along the way. And we've kind of followed that same template since we started um, the new program in 2020 because we had phases that we'd have to report out is this phase done or not done. So I don't really have a checklist, 
but there is specific um, through the policy that we have and um, some standard work on what the contract owner needs to do, you know, to fulfill the um, contract. They do have that. Right. All right. Thank you so much, Barb, for presenting. I think you said you needed to maybe scooch out a little early for another meeting today. So I appreciate you presenting. Oh, thank well, thank you. So you. I'll be able to stay for part of Corey's, but yeah. um, thank you. It's been, um, I'm so a little bit scared to do this, but this was all right. So you thank did you. A great, you did a great <laughs> job. Thanks so much. All right. All right. Let's share my screen and Corey, you're up. All right, Corey, can you see your screen? Corey? Oh. You're gonna need to unmute, Corey. I see you're still muted. There you go. Can you hear me now all right? Yes, I can hear you. Okay, perfect. All right, so are you able to maximize that just a smidge? If not, that's okay. It's showing on my, showing on the wrong screen. So hold on a second, let me, how about that? Can you, is that better? Oh, perfect. That is okay. much better. Okay, perfect. All right. So a lot of what Barb had said, we've been working on at UP Health System Bell as well. Um, we project because we actually received a citation per se from the Joint Commission back in 2019 during our triannual visit. So that's what made us focus on our contracts. Um, we needed to put a lot of things in place. Um, it is a work in progress, it takes time, and we're still working on it. But these are some of the things that we've put into place. Uh, we have since had an additional Joint Commission survey, and they did not find any issue with our process. So this time everything cleared very well. Um, so I'll just introduce kind of how we did it at our hospital. If you could advance, please. Um, this is just the agenda. These are the things that I'm going to go over with you today. Um, keeping quality the focus at our committee meeting, um, including quality measures in our OPPE and how we decide which measures to include. The quality expectations and the measures throughout the both the internal and the external contracts. Um, and then also I will finish with our annual evaluation and of our external contracts. Okay, next slide. So keeping quality of focus at our committee meetings. Um, quality is a standing agenda item at all of our committee meetings. Um, this also includes our governing board meeting. I'm sure this is the same for most, if not all of you, quality is a big thing. Um, committee meetings are a perfect time to share the work that's being done on any given item. Our quality packet includes um, some of, this is not all inclusive, this is only four things, but it's pertinent to the slide that, that we're gonna talk about today. Um, but not only do we present it at the committee meetings, we hand this out and post it throughout our hospital. So we have it on process boards. Um, we put it out in a bell, we call it bell weekly. Um, so once a month, this whole packet will go out to employees. So we try to reach as many people as possible to gather as much input. Um, sometimes there's really good ideas out there. Sometimes there's issues that we don't know about. So this really tries to loop everybody in um, and get everyone's input. Uh, the quality data from the packets, again, is posted on process boards. Um, and these are located throughout the break room on all of the units. So employees can look at this, they can review it. Um, the board is always full from H caps to harms to falls to whatever our focus is, um, to PI projects, you name it, this is the place for it. So it's all in one place. 
the next slide. So how we include quality measures in our OPPE. Um, this comes directly from our committee meeting. We review our quality measures regularly. We look at where we've been, where we want to be, and where we currently are. So this takes a lot of physician input. Um, so it's not any one entity or it's not the O team um, dictating what should go on the OPPE. And the physicians really have gotten on board with this. So they can recognize the things that maybe are falling out or there's been some drift in any given area and they make suggestions as to what can be put on their OPPE. So this is a group decision um, to identify issues. So for example, the most current addition to the OPPE was our sepsis measure and we were falling out pretty consistently with, within our bundle. Um, there was a lot of drill down with this. We identified a physician champion for this. And there's just a lot of really good work going on here. Um, but this is the measure that, that we've been working on, the most current measure that's been added to OPPE. And like I said, it's been pretty well accepted by our physicians. Um, HCAS is always a component, uh, but the categories change. So if we're doing really well in one category, or if we got to our goal or we're seeing the improvement that we've wanted, we'll change it up um, to make sure that we're addressing and staying on track with all of our measures. Next slide. So this is the top quarter of a sheet of paper. Um, I didn't want to put the physician's names on here, but this is what our OPPE looks like. And as you're going from left to right, uh, you can see where the HCAP measures come in. Um, and the yellow highlighted area here, this is where we added our sepsis. So when we broke down where the sepsis fallout had been, um, the physician champion got with the hospitalist and the team decided that these were the areas that they were wanting to be rated on. Um, this is the area that needed the most improvement and they actually worded it this way on the OPPE measure. Um, and since we put this in place at the beginning of 2023, at that time we were about 40% um, in compliance. So at the end of, cal of calendar year 2023, we were up just above 60%. So we saw a lot of really good movement with this. Um, so this is just an example, but we've done this quite often um, in the emergency department for physicians, uh, on, on the hospitalist side with OB physicians, uh, mainly our PCO2 rates for OB physicians. Um, but this is what it would look like. Okay, next slide. So the expectations being mentioned throughout the internal and external contracts, uh, I separated it out here into internal first, and I actually quoted how we have it worded within the contract. So with our internal contracts, um, physician contracts, things like that, um, this is how we have it worded. It's not very specific um, as to exactly which measures we are working on, um, but it just includes that there's participation and support for any measure currently being worked on. So the question from surveyors is, well, what is being worked on? Um, so we can explain to them, we can show, um, we can show minutes if we so choose, but usually they don't ask for minutes and we don't regularly share them. Um, but we will produce our dashboard, our graph, um, have discussions on what we're working on, and it's never been a problem. Um, they've never questioned it any further as to putting it exactly, spelling it out as to what measures we're working on. They just want to make sure that there's participation and active engagement. Um, orientation time with the quality director. So whenever a new hospitalist or physician is being onboarded at the facility here. 
Uh, they spend time with me as the quality director and we go over what measures we're currently working on, what our priorities are, depending on what their specialty area is. We focus on that, of course, the most. Um, we talk about peer reviews. We talk about all kinds of things. It's about a good hour, um, which really goes by fast when you start talking about all of the things. So external contracts, this is the big one. Um, I didn't put a quote as to what we typically have because it's always different in these external contracts, um, depending on what the contract is and who the vendor is and what the service is. So we always have some type of verbiage um, surrounding accreditation requirements, um, including the participation in committee meetings, following the recommendations of medical staff and the governing board. Um, that's really important and participation in the quality assessments and development of PI projects. So when the directors are looking at creating a PI project for their unit, uh, a lot of times they can tie that into an external contract, um, be it a delivery or supply, um, our hospice agency down on acute care. There's a lot of things that we can tie quality into. So. The directors are getting more comfortable doing that and not just think, doing the things that we could control within the walls of our building. They're bringing these external vendors and such into the whole project. So it's really good to see, and it's nice that they're getting more comfortable doing that. Okay, next slide. So annual evaluations, we conduct annual evaluations of our contracts, and this is where we fell out with the Joint Commission. This is exactly what we ended up getting, having to do a plan of action for. So the Joint Commission Contract Services, uh, the code is the LD 040309, and it states that care, treatment, and services provided through contractual agreements are provided safely and efficiently, or effectively, excuse me. Um, so EP6, there's there's a lot of things involved in, in these contracts and, and this part of the Joint Commission, um, but this is specific to the evaluation. So leaders are monitoring their contracted services by evaluating these services. Um, we do this annually. We do it at the beginning of the year, typically. We're going through that right now on our annual schedule. And we're pulling all of our contracts um, the contracts, for example, that are specific to respiratory therapy or sleep lab, that director is completing this evaluation as to timeliness of service, um, supplies, all of the things involved in that uh, evaluation. And that goes throughout the whole facility. We always have the evaluator be the one who works with the vendor or the contracted service the most. Um, we then review that evaluation. It goes through our QAPI committee, our patient safety committee, and eventually it goes all the way up to the board. Um, so everybody's aware as to what the expectations are, if they're being met, uh, which leads me to the next step in case they're not being met. Um, if they're not being met, then the Joint Commission expects that some type of an action or a revision will be done um, to to make sure that these contracts can be achievable. Um, these could include increased monitoring of the service the vendor is providing, um, consultation to the contractor, and at times it could even require a complete renegotiation of a contract term. So that's usually for something big that happens that's out of our control, um, and it's tied into the contract as an expectation um, that just realistically can no longer be met. So those are some of the, the standards and the things that we built our program from. And next slide. So this is the actual evaluation tool uh, that we use here at UP Health Systems Bell. I know it's not the best picture of it, but it's what worked with the slide the best here. Uh, so we go through uh, the contracted entity, and we look at all of these criteria, the timeliness, the efficiency, the accuracy, um, and between the reviewer signature and the overall satisfaction, 
there's actually a place where we can put any comments or concerns um, with communication. You know, we call there, we can never get a hold of you. Um, it's days before we're contacted back, anything like that. We can make additional comments to uh, the evaluation form itself. And then this is also shared with the vendor or the contracted service um, when it's completed. So they know our feelings toward their service, but I must say throughout the year when there's issues or if we see a concern or repetitive um, potential problem, that we are communicating with them. So it's, it's not a surprise when they get this evaluation. We're not waiting for a year before we're bringing up issues um, or trying to fix things to make it work better for, for both ends. So this is the tool that we use at UP Health Systems Bell. And I think that may be it. Any questions for me? Mm -hmm. um, Deb wanted to know who completes your evaluation checklist? So the evaluation checklist is completed by whichever director or department um, engages with that contracted service more frequently. So if it is for our hospice agency, um, the director of acute care and the case manager would complete that together. Um, with the input of the CNO, um, sometimes myself, and, and then it goes up to the board. And if the board has concerns or if they remember something that's happened throughout the year, they will bring that up at that time and we can always revisit that. So it's, it's just always flowing. It's in motion all the time. And yes, I can share that form. What would be the best way to share that? If you want to, you can send it to me and then I can just share it out to the group. Or okay. if you wouldn't mind either, I could use it as a resource underneath the open office. So while I share your presentations and today's recording, I could also share it on the website if you would be willing to do that as well. Otherwise, I could send you a little cleaner copy. That one okay. put a little color and do it when I pasted it onto the slides. So. Yeah, that's perfect. Okay. Were there any other questions? I know Barb did a really great job and she answered a lot of questions before, um, before I got to the presentation. So um, I appreciate that. And she shared a lot of great information and, uh, and she was absolutely right. Um, that's exactly how we did it when she was talking about um, the highest risk and because it's a big project. And when you're starting it, you have to have a rhyme or, re or reason as to where to start because it can get awfully overwhelming quickly. So we looked at our higher risk as well and the most impactful. So that was spot on. I guess my question is, I would just ask a question, is if your, um, your quality director or your quality folks there at your critical access hospitals do not currently have access to the contracts for your service lines, how would you recommend them going about asking for that kind of access? Because not everybody shares information universally. And so some people don't have the ability to take a look at contracts. How would you recommend them going about asking for those contracts? So we have all of our contracts via paper. So it's a big filing system. We don't have the um, electronic system right now. We really could use it and hopefully one day we will get there too. Um, so it's basically at the request. Um, we also include the contract with the evaluation when it's time for that annual review um, because otherwise, how do you know what you're evaluating on if you don't even know what the contract is? So those that are involved um, more directly will also know what that contract entails to do an accurate uh, evaluation of that. Looks like Deb said that she emails them to the key department leaders to complete an evaluation checklist. So thanks, thanks for sharing that, Deb. Yeah. All right. Thanks, Barb. Thank you.
Are there any other questions from anyone else that's participating this afternoon or anything that anyone else would like to share that what their facility does? It's maybe different than what Barb or, or Corey's currently doing. So that is cited by the DNB. Um, this month because contract list did not include all the new elements that just came out in October. Anybody else? If not, I'm going to let y'all have 14 minutes left of your lunch hour. <laughs> All right, well, I thank you all for joining the January open office hours. Appreciate you all jumping on and having such great questions. Thank you, Corey and Barb for presenting. And um, we will see you next month at February's open office hours. Have a great day, everyone. Bye.